Bible passage tonight comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one ab abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and I do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. This is God's word. Well, it's a joy uh, to open up God's Word tonight. Uh, please keep the passage open so that we can follow along. Uh, but before we do, let's uh, pray and ask the Lord for His special blessing on our time and for His ministry amongst us. Heavenly Father, uh, it is a great uh, and awesome privilege to gather around before you tonight we pray that you would be lifted up we thank you that you have gone before us already in the songs and the prayers and the reading of scripture and we pray that you would be you'd be lifted up through the proclamation of your word lord as the apostles creed states uh, we believe in the holy spirit and we pray that you would send him forth tonight in your power and that the word would go forth in his power and that our lives would be changed help us to see what you would have for us tonight help us to see much of christ help us to see what you have done lord we acknowledge that too many times we come together for worship and we leave the same way we arrived we pray that this would not be the case this evening you are worthy of so much more you are worthy of us bearing lives that reflect your son. Please, Lord, trim off what is displeasing to you. Please encourage and build up. Please strengthen where there's weakness. Please give hope where there is doubt. And please give joy where there is despair. We ask these things from you, our great God. We pray it in your son's name. Amen. Well, what we have this evening... Uh, from the Holy Spirit uh, through the Apostle Paul is a reminder, a reminder to the Corinthians. And, and Paul says himself that it is a reminder. And if you're anything like me, you rely heavily on reminders, whether it is alarm clock, stopwatch, post-it notes, calendars, a diary. Uh, I think I use all of the above. And we're indebted to reminders, right? We're indebted to them. They get us through each day and each week. But why do we set reminders? Or even why do we send reminders to people? What, what is the point? Because there are things in our life that are so important, so significant, that they just cannot be missed. And because of the fall, part of the effect on the fall uh, upon us is that we are forgetful. We don't retain everything. Everything. 
And we set reminders because there are some things that are so special. If we were to miss them, the outcome would be devastating. And you can think of some of those things. But Paul here waits to virtually the very end of this extremely long letter, virtually the end of it, to issue this great reminder that he has for them. It's like he saves it for the very end, the most important reminder that we could have. And the reminder that he gives is something that we should never lose sight of. So if you're with me in the text here, our first, first point tonight is the gospel handed down, the gospel handed down. Look at verse 1. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. Paul wants to direct their attention to the gospel, and he says, I want to remind you. He tells them, this is a reminder. So what Paul is going to cover in this passage, there's no new teaching here. There's no new doctrine. There's no surprises here in what he's about to write. The gospel was already known to them. About five years earlier, prior to writing this letter, about five years prior to this, he'd spent 18 months with them going through these things. And we know that they really did know the gospel because he says this, is the gospel, I preached it to you and you received it and it's the gospel in which you stand. Paul's saying, I've covered this when I was with you and you guys accepted it. And, and it's the reason why you are still here today. That is the proof. They are what they are because of the gospel. That's the only reason they are what they are, is because of what the gospel has done for them. They were doomed because of the fall. They were on the broad way that leads to destruction, but they have been made sons because of the gospel. They've been made heirs of the kingdom because of this gospel. And you see this in verse 2. Look at the beginning of verse 2. By this gospel, you are saved. By this gospel, you are saved. And so we can just see here, even in the first two verses, the key, the key thing here that we're dealing with is the gospel. He's already said it twice in, in just over a verse. Now, the gospel is, has become a kind of Christian buzzword. It's kind of this word that you're supposed to say when you're describing your local church or the ministry that you're involved in, or the things that you do, or what your church is focused. It's, it's kind of the thing that you're supposed to emphasize when you're talking. You know, we say things, well, our church, we're all about the gospel, or our ministries are gospel-focused and gospel-centered. You hear things like that. But when you begin to use the word gospel so regularly and so loosely, it starts to get used in kind of unbiblical ways and we start saying things like we just need to live out the gospel and then probably worse yet is preach the gospel sometimes or you preach the gospel often and use only words if you have to this, this kind of idea that you can live out the gospel well if you think about it that's 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 pretty hard to do it's actually kind of ridiculous and nonsensical why because the gospel means good news. You can't live good news. You can't live out a historical event, something that has happened. You can't live that out. Paul reminds us that the gospel is Jesus died, he was buried, and he was raised. You can't live that out. You can't live news. Jesus lived that out. It's what he did. It's a message. And that's why in verse 2, he says, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. So the gospel is the word I preach to you. It's a message. And then he gives that fearful warning in verse 2. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Now, this warning, Paul's not saying that you can lose your salvation, that you can be saved and then something happens and then you become unsaved. You're born again and then you're unborn. It's not what he's doing here. 
Rather, Paul's giving a warning against not receiving the gospel rightly. And, and this, this is a tragedy that happens too often. It's people who come and hear it, but they don't think through it. It's kind of a spur-of-the-moment kind of acceptance. They actually, like Jesus says, they, they don't count the cost. They don't think through what they're doing, and they kind of give the gospel a lip service kind of, I agree to it. And, and Jesus warned about this kind of faith over and over in his parables. You know, the parable of the sower. All of these people seem to have faith and believe the gospel, but only some of them hold on. And then you've got the parable of the virgins, the ten of them, all of them are looking for Jesus, but only some of them had oil. And then you've got the parable of the builders, and only one of them had a foundation. Then you get the parable of the servants who are given talents, and, and one of them didn't use it. It's all kind of getting at the same thing here. Believing incorrectly. We all know people and have experienced people uh, who have fallen into this kind of fate who kind of gave a profession. They looked the part and they walked away. I have people that are very close to me that have done this. So who are, who are those that hold firm? Who are the ones that hold firm to the word, to the gospel preached? It's those that are held firm by God. What did Jesus say in John chapter 10? He likens himself to a shepherd, his people as his sheep. And he says this, John 10, 28, I give my sheep eternal life. No one can snatch them from my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them from my father's hand. Who's doing the holding on here? You see, if faith doesn't endure, it was self-manufactured. If faith doesn't last, it wasn't the real deal. It wasn't from above wasn't genuine. Paul says it's vain believing. And this is a sobering warning to these wayward Corinthians, right? They had deviated so much. And Paul gives this strong warning. It's a timely motivation to cling to the gospel that they've received. Friends, there is nothing, nothing more important in your life than this. Nothing. Isn't that what he says in the very next verse? Look at verse 3. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. There is nothing more important. The gospel is first importance. The subject of singleness and marriage and parenting, that's not first importance. Spiritual gifts, no. Decoding the end times, no. That's not it. Talking about dreams, visions, supernatural, miracles, that's not it. Even church governance and how a church is supposed to be ruled, that's not it. That's not most important. The roles of men and women in the church, no. Social justice, no. The latest headlines and the world crises going on at the moment, no. The gospel is of first importance. Christ's death and his resurrection. This is what Paul said at the beginning of the letter. Remember in chapter 2, verse 2. For I resolved when I was among you to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what you got from me. 18 months. That's what you got. The gospel. The gospel. It's all about that. And the gospel is the offense to Jews. It is the stumbling block to the Jews. And it is foolishness to Gentiles. And it is foolishness to our world. It is foolishness to our generation. And churches, they can become so distracted with other things than the gospel. Programs, ministries, business, items, opinions. If Paul had his own church and he had a sign at the front of his church, it would read this, we preach Christ crucified. And when you got a church bulletin as you worked, walked in the door at his church, on the front it would say this, we preach Christ crucified. That's what you get at our church. That's of first importance. It's all about that. 
And did you notice here how he talks about the transmission of the gospel? Look at verse 3. He says, For what I received, I passed on to you. There's two things here in the transmission of the gospel. First, he says, I passed it on to you. Understand this. No one discovers the gospel of themselves. No one teaches the gospel to themselves. It's something that is passed on to us. You either read it from the scriptures or you have it preached to you or shared to you. It is passed on to us. No one discovers it of themselves. Second thing that he says about the transmission of the gospel, what I received, I passed on to you. You see, the gospel is not something that we alter and adjust for our current generation. It is something that is passed down. It is something that is handed down. It's not our role to change it. It's not our role to add to it or to subtract from it. It's not our job to sharpen it or soften it. It's not our job to make it more exciting. It is our job to pass on what we have received. That's what he has commanded from us, to pass it on to the coming generation, to our children, to our grandchildren. The gospel is passed on. The gospel is a baton. It is a baton that must be shared. It is the gospel from God, the gospel of his son. It is given by his spirit and it was passed to the apostles and they preached it to the world and they recorded it down in scripture and it has been handed on to us. And now we take that gospel having received it and we go as ambassadors of Christ, as heralds of the king and we pass on the gospel we have received. This is what we've been called to. So firstly, we have seen the gospel is handed down. He reminds them of that. Secondly, he reminds them of the gospel message. The gospel message. Look at the second half of verse 3 and verse 4. What I pass down to you of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, Paul sums up the Gospel in three bullet points. Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus was raised. He summarizes the Gospel in this way. Again, he's giving it in short form. Now today, there is no real legitimate debate among scholars about the historicity of Jesus of Nazareth. There's no real, de- there's no real debate that he really existed. We have the historical biblical records, and we also have extra biblical records and secular sources that mention a man 2,000 years ago named Jesus lived. And he died in Israel. There's no real debate about that. What then does the debate concerning this Jesus rage on about then? Well, not just that Jesus died. What does Paul say? Christ died for our sins. And therein lies the controversy. Therein lies the controversy. This is a significant detail that Paul adds to it. And it is absolutely vital to the the gospel message. Paul is saying, when you look at the historical account of what happened to Jesus, you need to keep this in mind. When you see, when you read of Jesus that he was flogged, when you read them plunging a crown of thorns into his skull, when you see him nailed through his hands and his feet into the wood, when you see them raising up the cross and as he's suspended in the air, and when you see him breathe his last breath, that was for our sins. It was for our sins, all of that. That's why it happened. He wasn't dying merely as some example like some like to talk about it. He wasn't dying as a martyr. They got him and he couldn't escape. He was dying for our sins. See, many 
many claiming to be under the Christian umbrella today. They know about the historical facts about Jesus, that he was flogged, whipped, and that he died, he was crucified. They know the facts, but they don't understand its meaning. And I was one of them. Even though I grew up in church, the meaning of what Paul says here, he died for our sins. The paycheck for sin is death. That's what a life of sin deserves. And he comes to pay that fine. He comes salvation by another who didn't sin. He comes and he dies as a substitute. That's why he comes. He died for our sins. Bryson Smith, he comments on an article that was in the Sydney Morning Herald. And he says, the article was all about movie stand-ins. They're the people who replace movie stars in scenes that are dangerous or just uncomfortable. Like Glenn Duhigg, an ex-lawyer who worked as a stand-in for Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible 2. Glenn, the stand-in, says this, quote, It sounds very glamorous saying that you're the stand-in for Tom Cruise. But I don't think many people realize the long hours and constant demands that deflate your ego very quickly. The days are long. Whatever scene Tom was in, I would be the one standing there, being him for sometimes ages as the crew set up the shot, getting the lighting just right and the props set up. I'd be standing there for hours in the weather, getting drenched in the rain or sunstroke of the heat. And then Tom would just walk on the set from his air-conditioned caravan or out of his beautiful sports car once the scene was ready. Another movie stand-in also said this, quote, I realized very quickly the difference between being a star and being a stand-in. End quote. Paul is saying that Jesus, he was our stand-in. He was the one that suffered For our sins. He was the one that was punished for our sins. Jesus didn't just stand out in the rain for us. He endured the cross. Jesus didn't just stay out in the scorching heat for us. He felt the burning wrath of his Father that was directed towards us. And he stood in the gap. Christ did all of that in our place. And we're spared all of it. We're spared all of it all the uncomfortable, all the unpleasant, all the pain. What's so remarkable about this is that Tom Cruise, he would never, ever stand in for Glenn Duhigg. Tom Cruise, he's the superstar. Glenn, he, he's a nobody. Tom Cruise, he's the great one. Who's Glenn? No one knows of him. And the remarkable thing is, Jesus, who is the greatest of all, he dies for hell-deserving nobodies. This is the greatness of the sacrifice he took our place. That is our gospel. Christ died for our sins. And this is what offends people. This is what is not tolerated and accepted. People wear crosses and crucifixes as jewelry and necklaces. And, and often people, when they think of the cross, they look at the cross and Christ dying and they think, wow, how much am I worth? How special must I be for Christ to do this? It is an entirely different thing altogether, hearing that that bloodied sacrifice on the cross reveals the magnitude of our guilt that it took God's Son to be accursed by His Father to pay for our sin. He died for our sins. And yet, this is just not not accepted today. It's not wanted. I've said it many years ago, and it just astounds me, how many times has the lyrics to the hymn Amazing Grace been revised? You just do a Google search. That line, that that great line, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You look at its 
you look at its development of that hymn, it's then changed to that saved a soul like me. Another version that saved someone like me. Another version that saved and set me free. We don't want to hear it anymore, let alone sing about it. In 2008, in 2008 a committee of theologians and musicians banded together to do a massive look through and revision of, of hymns in the hymnal books. One of the hymns that was targeted is In Christ Alone. There is that line in the song, the original says, And on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Well, the committee got together and what did they change it to? And on that cross as Jesus died, the love of God was magnified. We don't want to hear it anymore. We don't want to hear it anymore. I remember when I was first saved, I heard an analogy that stuck with me. It stuck with me. And that was some 12 years ago. And the preacher said this, during the day, where did all the stars go? You can't see them. Where did they go? Did, did, did someone go up there and, and, and take them? And someone steal them and they, do they put them back every night? Or do they turn off during the day and only come back on at night? Where did they go? You can't see them during the day because there's too much light. You can't see their splendor because there's too much light. It is exactly the same with our gospel. You cannot see the glory and the brilliance of the gospel when we keep shining too much light on it. When do you see the glory of the gospel? When it's presented against the backdrop of the blackness of our sin. And the sacrifice of Christ is immeasurably beautiful. Because you see what he's done. Christ died for our sins. And then Paul adds an essential detail to Jesus' death. Verse 3, he died for our sins according to the scriptures. This is vital to our gospel. It wasn't just when people watched Jesus crucified. Some people looked at that and interpreted and like, hey, that's kind of like him and the lambs in the temple. That's kind of, and they interpreted that way. No, no, no. Paul says, this was foretold in the scriptures. This was written about. This was God's plan. And there are many passages we could go to. Primarily Isaiah 53. And there are many others, many Psalms, all pointing to Christ needing to die. This was God's plan before the foundation of the world. God's plan. Jesus was born to die. He was born to die. The second bullet point that Paul gives of the gospel. The first one is Jesus died. The second one, and that he was buried. Now, what's so significant about that? I mean, it seems kind of insignificant, Jesus' burial. Well, it actually is vital to the gospel because the bur- Jesus' burial confirms that he really died. He really died. This wasn't a hoax. This wasn't a great plan to make it look like something. He was buried because he actually and truly died. The Son of God died. And then the third bullet point that he gives of the gospel is where the debate of Christ really rages. What's the third one? And that he was raised on the third day. Jesus' resurrection. This is where the controversy, controversy lies. But Jesus being raised is essential to the, to the Christian gospel. This is absolutely necessary because death and the grave are the curse of sin. And if Jesus didn't rise, if he stayed dead, then Jesus is under the curse like us. And if Jesus doesn't rise, neither will we. We won't. Because the curse and the sting of death remains. Jesus had to rise if he doesn't. All the promises of heaven and eternal life are undone. Now, something that the Greek captures here that the English doesn't, in between each bullet point of the gospel is the word end. It's one sentence. So literally in the Greek, it reads this, Jesus died for our sins and he was buried and he was raised and he appeared. What's it it doing? Each bullet point, each of these elements is vital to the gospel. Take one away, the whole thing falls apart. Take one away and the whole thing comes down. Let me quote Barnett. He likens the gospel to a garment, and he says this, quote, No part of this garment can be cut out, otherwise the whole robe 
unravels. He died, he was buried, he was raised. And we also see in this, the gospel, it's all about Jesus. He died, he was buried, he was raised. It's all about Christ. It's all about him. And Paul adds to it, he was buried and raised on the third day according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. Now, there are verses that we could cite here that point to it. Hosea 6, Psalm 16, which the New Testament writers quote. Also, the third day in the Old Testament often reflects and symbolizes the day of salvation in many passages. But I think with this, the, Paul's not just trying to say, go try and find the verse that, that says that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. That's not the point, but that all Scripture was pointing to this. Remember when Jesus, after he rose from the dead, and he was walking on the road to Emmaus with those two disciples, and they're so upset that, that the Christ, they thought Jesus was the Messiah, but he's dead. And Jesus is, hit, is veiled, and he speaks to them, and he says this, Luke 24, Jesus said to them, O foolish ones, And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The whole Bible was pointing to this. It was all about him and what he was going to do. But this is here is where where the debate rages over Christ, right? That Christians claim that Jesus rose from the dead. And this is where the world stumbles and they scoff. Come on. People don't come back from the dead. That's myth. That's legend. That's fairy tale stuff. That didn't happen. They just said that to keep his name alive and keep this thing going on. Paul knows that. And this leads to our next point tonight, the gospel's eyewitnesses. The gospel's eyewitnesses. Now, Paul doesn't just give one eyewitness of the resurrected Jesus. No, he doesn't do that. No. Something as vital as a resurrection, God wanted to give many, many, many witnesses. Look at verses 5 to 7. And that he appeared to Peter, and then he appeared to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Most of them were still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. What a list, right? Of all the people that Christ appeared to. First, you have Peter. He appears to Peter first, not because Peter earned the privilege. Remember, he just denied Christ three times. It's to magnify his grace. And remember at the beginning, he says, if you hold firmly to this message, Peter let go of Christ, but Christ held on to him. And then Peter was that one who gave the glorious sermon at Pentecost, the first preacher of the disciples. Secondly, he says, Jesus appeared to the 12. Obviously, this is minus Judas, because Judas has hung himself before Christ died. But it is the 12 who became eyewitnesses and then preachers. Thirdly, he says, this is probably the most remarkable appearance. You see in verse 6, after that he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at the same time. What a staggering event. What what an incredible amount of witnesses. And you'll notice, Paul says very intentionally, he appeared to these 500 at the same time. What's he doing? This removes any subjectivity. You know how people like to say all the time, I had this dream about Jesus. Oh, I had this vision of Jesus. It's so subjective and you kind of got to take their word for it. This personal thing. Paul says, no, no, no. It was an appearing in front of more than 500. Everyone experienced the same thing. Everyone saw the same thing. Paul is saying this was a public event. You know when you hear those accounts of UFO sightings, you know, they tend to have the same thing in common. What what does each reporting have similar? It happened in a remote field somewhere in the middle of nowhere. There was no one else around and I was abducted by an alien. Paul says, our vision of Christ, the resurrected Christ, his appearance was nothing like that. More than 500 of us saw this. More than 500 witnesses saw it. (laughs) 
And then he even adds most of those 500, they're still alive. What's he saying? These Christians, they're still alive today. Go and ask them. Go and let them tell you what they saw. And their story will all match. They were all there. Go and ask them. Or the resurrection was verified. The resurrection is true. And he says some of them have fallen asleep. Why does he say that some of them have fallen asleep when they've died? Why why does he say fallen asleep instead of died? How fitting a phrase to use on a passage about the resurrection. Think about it. What do you do in the morning when you wake up after sleeping? You rise from your bed. Paul says, brothers and sisters who've died in Christ, they're just sleeping. They will rise. They will rise. That's why Christian funerals are so different. Let me quote Garland. He says the following, quote, while graveyards remind us of the brevity of life, the resurrection ensures the brevity of death. Paul calls more witnesses. He calls James. Then he calls the rest of the apostles, those who were outside of the 12, but who witnessed it and became preachers and messengers. Christ appeared to all these. But, but Paul says Jesus had one more stop. Look at verse 8. Verse 8. And last of all, he appeared to me also as one, as to one abnormally born. Paul says, last of all, he appeared to me. I saw the resurrected Jesus, and we know that was when he was on the road to Damascus. But Paul saw the resurrected Christ so much later than everyone else. After Jesus rose from the dead, he stayed for 40 days appearing to people, and then he ascended into heaven. Paul saw the resurrected Jesus after his ascension. He came back down from heaven and visited Paul. Paul's experiences was was much more unique. And Paul calls himself, he says, he appeared to me as as one who is abnormally born. Now, it's not saying that he had some kind of deformity about himself. The Greek word here is an uncomfortable term. And it often refers to a miscarriage or to a stillbirth or to an abortion. A child that is removed or taken out of the womb early. It's, It's a helpless life that is in desperate need of intervention. And Paul likens himself to this helpless little life, to this lifeless being prior to his conversion. That was the state that he was in. And that leads to our last point. Let me be brief. The gospel of grace. The gospel of grace. Verse 9, Paul says, I am the least of the apostles, and I I, I do not even deserve to be called an apostle. Paul says, I am the least of them. Uh, But Paul planted so many churches. Yeah, but he didn't walk with Christ. He wasn't part of the 12. He had far less experience than the rest. And he says, I don't even deserve to be called an apostle. But Paul, you are the missionary to the world. Christianity went to the world because of you. And he says, but I persecuted the church of God. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I attacked the church. I harassed them. I'm all about the Great Commission now, but I wasn't always that way. I tried to bring it to extinction. I was one of those Pharisees, those hypocrites. I was a wolf, and I hunted sheep. I was an enemy. I was working for Satan, and I didn't even realize it. Paul says, I don't deserve forgiveness, and I didn't deserve to be called an apostle. I do not deserve this. And so we have to ask the question, why would God forgive such a man as Paul who attacked Jesus' bride? And why on top of that would he make him one of his own personal messengers and representatives? Why would God do that? There's only one explanation. Look at verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Why should God save anyone? Why should he send his son? Why should he care about any of us? Why should he show us love? It's the grace of God. It is the grace of God. This is what Paul is celebrating here. The undeserved favor of God. And this is the essence of the gospel. The grace of God 
This is the song that we sing, the grace of God. This is what differentiates Christianity from everything else. It is a religion of grace, of grace. We believe in grace. You know, John Newton, who penned Amazing Grace, when he was an old man at the age of 82, in his dying days, you know what he's quoted saying? He said this, quote, My memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. The grace of God, this is what we rejoice in. None of us in this room deserve to be in heaven. None of us deserve forgiveness, but the grace of God, the grace of God. And so we praise Him for it. And grace not only saves, but it has an ongoing effect. Look at all of verse 10. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of the apostles, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Grace has an ongoing effect in the life of a believer. Paul worked so hard for Christ. He traveled, he suffered, he tortured, he, pl- he was tortured, he planted churches. He gave everything. He gave more than the other apostles. He did. And he could say that. But Paul recognized something. He knew how all of that was accomplished. I was reading over this, and I remembered back to when I was in primary school. And and you might have had the same thing in your school when you were young. I was really young, year one, year two. When when Mother's Day and Father's Day would be approaching, the school would would, um, send out a letter to the parents and saying, next week... Give your children some money because we're going to have a Mother's Day stall or a Father's Day stall and your child needs to come bring some money so that they can select out a gift for Mother's Day or Father's Day. And we used to come bringing some money as little kids and we walk through the library and they'd have all the gifts spread out and then we'd go and choose one. And then on Mother's Day or Father's Day, we'd be so excited because we get to give mum and dad a present. We got to give them a present. And it was really special. But I never used to think through what was actually going on. Mom gave me that money for the present. She bought herself the present. I just picked it out. Paul is saying, I worked harder than everyone. Yet not I, but the grace of God working in me. It was his money. It is his strength. It is his gifts. It is his success. What did we just sing in that hymn? beautifully encapsulated it. Quote, I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need his power is displayed. And then what does it say? Yet not I, but through Christ in me. It's the work of Christ. And then Paul says in verse 11, whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. Paul sums up the reminder and says, this is the gospel. So whether it's me preaching, Peter, James, any of the apostles, any of them, we only have one message. We have only one message and there's only one gospel and this is it. Church, this is our gospel and this is what we cling to. This is what's been passed on to us and this is what we're to pass on. Let us rejoice in this gospel. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the gospel, your gospel, that came from you, that is of your Son, that was sent by the Spirit, that was preached to us, that has been recorded in the Holy Scriptures, that we have come to receive because of your grace. We rejoice in you. We do not deserve this love. We do not deserve this salvation, but we thank you for all that you have done. Help us to be faithful to the gospel that you have given. God, forgive us for when we try to be clever. Forgive us for when we try to bring the results. Forgive us for when we adjust things so as to please man. And God, we pray that the gospel would continue to go forth from this place into our community and would go forth from each person in this room into our workplaces, amongst our families. And we pray, oh God, if there are any here who do not believe the gospel, come now, come and win them over with the grace 
of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray in his name. Amen. Well, we are going to have sung to us a great gospel song. Thank you, Scott.